So serendipity or hard work? Uh, is it about timing? Is, uh, is it the serendipity is when you find something when you're looking for something else. Gentleman on the left, uh, penicillin, uh, you know, a bit of fungus on the windowsill. Uh, but look at his lab. Looks like he's been doing hard work. Serendipity, we heard a little bit about that from Tony Raven. We've also got the video of David Brown, whose patent it actually is. I was looking for, um, you know, a drug for, for uh, medicine, uh, for heart, for uh, chronic heart care, and it came up with uh, Viagra, right? So looking over here for a, for a solution, found something over there. And that has been a 40, it became when he last talked at Enterprise Tuesday last year, it was by then a 40 billion pound uh, product. Uh, so <clears throat> that's serendipity. People also tell me, and we can ask our speakers later, is the best time to start a business during a recession or when the market is going up? So how do you get the time? You can't create a recession, right? So do you jump on one when it's there? Um, well, I know the banks might have done it, uh, Phil, you're quite right, uh, with subprime lending. So there's a whole bunch of factors that we think goes into the business of questioning yourself about luck, serendipity, hard work. And these are, they start off with a, an economist called Kersner. It talks about entrepreneurial alertness. So the idea is that if you have the intention to start a business, then you become alert to all the information around you about starting a business. It's like if you want to buy a car, a house, a, a, a washing machine, whatever other product you want to buy, suddenly your radar is on that you're looking and scanning and doing comparisons. It's a bit like that with your career. Looking for a job in banking, you look for jobs that are advertising that. If you're looking to start a business, maybe you turn up to things like Enterprise Tuesday, join up with Q and so on. So intention is the start point, which then, according to the theorists, makes you more alert to what's going on around you, to people, to ideas, to concepts, and so forth, which then is dependent on a level of self-belief and confidence. You know what, I think I can do this, uh, so I'm alert, I'm, I'm raised, I'm meeting people, networking with them, building my social capital, and then it depends on your circumstances. Are you in debt? Your family, will they support you? Are you in Silicon Fen, Silicon Valley? Do you work and live in Bombay? Are you in a small rural village somewhere in North Wales? Where are you based? Where are the customers? Where are the products around you? Uh, and then you want to go and develop some skills maybe and get some commercial know-how. Um, that's not done usually rigorously enough, but you know that's some of the things that you might want to do. Well, this means that when the time is ripe, which is a wonderful Cambridge concept, I, Kairos and Kronos, Kronos being a clock, Kairos being when time feels, when it feels right to do something. For those of you that have made a proposal to a young woman or a young woman has received or made a proposal to a young man to marry, do you do it at a certain time? You know, I'll do it at nine o'clock on the 5th of December, or do you go, when it feels right, I'll make the proposal, right? This is not a dating uh, advice, by the way. This is just a, a sense. <laughs> So you then, when you see all these things line up, then you jump on it, you know, and then maybe uh, luck can visit you and you look lucky at that point, but you have done all the preparatory work to become lucky. So these are some of the concepts that we'll pick up again during Q&A. I'm looking forward very much to hearing the story from Rahul and from Seamus, about uh, 15 to 20 minutes each, I think was uh, what we have, so we then have Q&A. So this is actually a magical moment for me because 10 years ago, which sounds ridiculous when I say it, but 10 years ago, I was sitting exactly where you guys are sitting now. In fact, I was sitting exactly where this gentleman is sitting because I'm kind of anal, so I would always sit in exactly the same place. And I was listening to somebody like me tell the audience how they'd grown their business, listening and occasionally sleeping, so thank you for not sleeping. It really is a privilege to be here, thank you. So we all know what hard work looks like, but what is serendipity? Serendipity is happy accident. Specifically, it's when we find something good or useful when we weren't directly looking for that thing. And how much of our success is driven by hard work? How much of it is driven by serendipity? It's easy to look at successful entrepreneurs and go, oh, they were in the right place at the right time. That's why they became successful. It's just as easy, actually, to look at entrepreneurs and go, well, they worked really, really hard for 20 years, 
And that's why they became successful. But the truth is, you need both. You absolutely need both. Now, I want to tell you guys a story. This isn't the story of my last company, Reportive, which was recently acquired by LinkedIn, but it is the story of how we got there. It starts in 1989. I was six years old, and my father was writing up his PhD. In order to do this, he bought a computer. As I recall, it was a Tandon 286. It ran DOS and, believe it or not, also Windows 1. <laughs> now, my parents are both doctors, and often they had to work late. This meant that it wasn't unusual that after school, I had an hour to two hours to kill before I was picked up and taken home. I would spend those hours in the library. And in the library, I found these books, books on how to program computers. And I read them voraciously from cover to cover. And being obsessed with video games, which I still am, I used to write my own, starting first with BBC Basic, a few years later, I then discovered Visual Basic, and a few years after that, taught myself C and C++. So all the way through secondary school, I was programming computers. I was making video games, making simulations of artificial life, writing music sequences. Uh, with my friend from school over there, we made a virtual tour of our high school or secondary school. We made scientific visualizations, a visualization of the hydrogen orbital. The net result of all of this was, by the time I got to Cambridge in 2002 to study computer science, I had already been programming for 10 years. I'm pretty certain I had been programming for 10,000 hours by the time I got here. As a result, even though I have never professionally worked as a programmer, I am able to prototype my own ideas, and I, I am able to work really effectively with full-time developers. It turns out this is incredibly valuable if you're starting a company where the main activity is programming. So, was that serendipity, or was it hard work? My dad buying a computer and leaving it lying around? 100% serendipity. Me spending time in the library reading programming books? Serendipity. Me spending 10 years programming, building stuff? Well, I guess you'd count that as hard work, but to be honest, it didn't really feel like it. 2002, who recognizes this scene? Hands up. Pretty much all been there. First week of university, I go to the Freshers Fair. I wander around. I look for things to do, societies to join. One in particular sticks out at me. Cambridge University Entrepreneurs. Well, at the time, our logo was really bad. Way worse than this. They were promoting Enterprise Tuesday, the very lecture series we're all sitting in right now. Except back in 2002, it was called The Basics of Building a Business. And I turned up to the first lecture that Michaelmas, I think Shai was talking, and he was going on about the importance of managing a cash flow. And I remember thinking to myself, Shai, one day this will be extremely useful to me, but today is not that day. <laughs> Because studying at Cambridge is really fucking hard. <laughs> I'm going to focus on crushing my degree. So I made the decision that day to not come to Enterprise Tuesday and actually to come two years later in my third year. And as a result, I did well at computer science. Each year I graduated in the top five in my class. As an undergraduate, it turns out that through hard work and focus alone, you can actually achieve what you want. Business isn't like that. 
Three years later, 2005, I come back to Enterprise Tuesday. It's always taken place here, sometimes in the Judge Business School. And the speaker at the time challenged us. He said, those of you who are in computer technology, put up your hands. I did, and so did about five other people. As you can tell, we were all very shy. He then challenged us, after this lecture, go and talk to each other. Make something happen. So I spoke to one of those guys, and he said to me, I've got this world-changing business idea. And I need a team of five awesome computer scientists to build a demo this summer. And I said to him, without skipping a beat, well, I know the finest computer scientists in my year, and we're all graduating this summer. Let me build that team for you. And so I did. After we graduated, I recruited and led this team. I think Gareth and Tom are in the audience over there. Hello, Gareth. Hello, Tom. And since then, we've become lifelong friends, and we've actually co-founded multiple companies together. So was this serendipity, or was this hard work? Being in the right Enterprise Tuesday at the right time, pure serendipity. Meeting the guy who inspired me to put together this team with whom I worked later, pure serendipity. Recruiting this team, leading them through the highs, and leading them through the lows, and there were some pretty low lows, and then working with them on future ventures, that was bloody hard work. That summer, 2005, the Center for Entrepreneurial Learning, in association with some other organizations, put on a conference, Sane Lumiere. It was a beautiful garden party conference. Myself and the team, we were at that conference in a tent for interesting startups, and we were presenting our demo. As the conference wound down, I started networking with the people around. And I met a committee member from Cambridge University Entrepreneurs. And I was just about to start a PhD a few months later. So I said to him, I was like, how can I get involved? How do I become part of this organization? And later that year, he invited me to the first committee meeting for Cambridge University Entrepreneurs. And as you'll later see, that random, serendipitous encounter changed everything for me. I did actually start the PhD in October 2005 because I was under the delusion that starting a PhD is a great way to start a company. It's a terrible way to start a company. Turns out the best way to start a company is, in fact, just to start a company. <laughs> so I spent one and a half years doing everything but my PhD. I began to dabble in entrepreneurial side projects. And because my PhD was in computer vision, one of those side projects was Sudoku vision. And you'll recognize these faces. It was a very simple idea. We built a mobile app that lets you take a photograph of a Sudoku puzzle. It then lets you play that puzzle on your phone. And if you got stuck, it would give you a hint. If you were about to give up, it would even solve it for you. But this was 2006. There was no iPhone. There was no App Store. The only real way to distribute a mobile app was to negotiate a pre-installation deal with a carrier or a handset manufacturer. Now, we did actually end up in negotiations with a major handset manufacturer. But ultimately, that deal fell through. And so we were sad. We were dejected. You know, we put in a man year of effort. This thing went nowhere. But remember the story because we'll come back to it later. Whilst I was working on Sudoku Vision and whilst I wasn't working on my PhD, I also became increasingly involved with Cambridge University entrepreneurs. Apparently, I was being headhunted by Seamus and by Stu, who's over there, 
to run the organization, although I was blissfully unaware of this at the time. In any case, they must have been very convincing because by the end of 2006, I was president of Cambridge University Entrepreneurs. And I went out and I recruited a committee and together with the help of Seamus, Stu, and our other mentors and advisors, we went out to raise sponsorship for the organization. And we ended up raising so much sponsorship that we could afford to pay myself to run the organization full time. So I took a sabbatical from my PhD. Best decision ever. <laughs> During that sabbatical, I learned how to raise money, how to sell with little more than a dream. It turns out that's an incredibly useful life skill. I got to know the local angel investor and venture capital community. Also incredibly helpful. I got to meet so many entrepreneurs, like my fellow committee members, Kanal, N.A., Gareth, Seamus, Stu, just to name a few. And I ended up starting ventures with all of these people. As you can see, we ate a lot of cake. Those were good times. We were a very tight-knit group. So was this serendipity, or was it hard work? It was serendipity that put that opportunity in front of me. It was Seamus and Stu, who I happened to meet, who thought, well, maybe he'd be a good fit for the organization. But I had to grab that opportunity. I had to walk away from a PhD, which I had fought so hard to get into. I had to put in a ton of hard work to make this organization successful. And I think the, the president this year, we just heard from him, he knows it's, it's not like it's cerebral work, it's just really boring, menial labor. Actually, it's quite like running a business. You have to put that in to make it worth it. After running Cambridge University Entrepreneurs, I could not face going back to the PhD. So my sabbatical became a permanent intermission. And I spent the summer playing with ideas of businesses I wanted to create. I did supervisions at the computer lab in order to pay the bills. Towards the end of this year, 2007, Seamus and Stu approached me again and were like, hey, we have this company that we've just started, Mojo. We'd like you to join and be a technical co-founder. So I worked with them for a bit, fell in love with the idea, and I said, yes, I will join your company. Nine months later, it became clear we needed another co-founder, way more technical than I am. And so I called my old friend Sam, with whom I'd worked summers earlier. And so as a result, I found myself working with a team I respected immensely as a co-founder of a cool web technology company backed by some of the best known and most respected technology angel investors in town. Was that serendipity or was it hard work? Well, it was a stream of random encounters that got me to knowing Seamus and Stu and Sam. But I believe it was Seamus and Stu watching me run Cambridge University Entrepreneurs and take risks with that organization and ultimately succeed that made them want to invite me to be part of their journey. In 2007, something magical happened. Apple invented the iPhone. And two years later, I was back in this room attending the Cambridge University Entrepreneurs 1,000 pounds business ideas competition. And I remember sitting in the audience, again, I was there, and the winners were just being announced. And one of the companies, Magic Solver, walks on stage and starts pitching 
their vision for the world. They saw a world where everybody had a smartphone, that had a camera, that knew where you were, that was always connected to the internet. And they were pitching their idea for their first app. It's a very simple idea. They were going to make a mobile app that let you take a photograph of a Sudoku puzzle, which would then let you play that puzzle on your phone. I was like, I was blown away. I, you know, I was hearing exactly the same pitch, almost word for word, that I'd given a few years ago. But this time, the market was ready, the hardware was there, the software was there, the distribution channel was there. So I didn't waste any time. I found the team after the event. This is Emmanuel and Oliver. And we invested our technology, the app that we'd built, into their company to give them a head start with building that company. And as a result, I'm now a small but proud shareholder in a rapidly going mobile startup that's actually remarkably profitable and is now employing over 20 people. Serendipity or hard work? Well, we put in a ton of hard work years before and tried to get this thing off the ground and it went nowhere. Years later, serendipity gave us the opportunity to benefit from it. Whilst I was running Cambridge University Entrepreneurs, I had the great fortune to get to know Neil Davidson. He's one of the founders and joint CEOs of Redgate Software. This man is one of the superstars of Cambridge. And whilst we were running Mojo, we were looking for a new place to work from. For about nine months, we'd worked out of my lounge in my house in Cambridge. And I had heard on the grapevine that Redgate Software was overflowing their old offices and were about to move into brand new offices in the Cambridge Business Park where they'd have tons of spare room. So I sent Neil an email. I was like, yo, Neil, can we have some desks? And he wrote me back and he was like, sure, take as many of our old desks as you like. We don't need them anymore. So I wrote back to him and I was like, uh, no, that's actually not what I meant. We'd like to come to your office and sit at your desk next to you, if that would be okay, please. We will tell you jokes and occasionally buy you donuts. And he didn't get back to me for about a week and I thought, damn it, I pissed the guy off. But a week later, he got back to me it's like a one-sentence email. He was like, sure, move in. You don't even have to pay rent. Like, what a guy, amazing guy. Well, word about this, as you would expect, got around the local startup community in Cambridge. About six months after we moved in, a company called Broadsheet asked Neil, hey, can we have some desks? And Neil was like, okay, sure, you can move in. A few months later, another company, go test it, asked Neil, hey, can we have some desks? And he was like, all right, then have some desks. Then another company, Mixcloud, asked Neil, hey, can we have some desks? And he was like, okay, you can have some desks. Redgate seemed to love the idea of having cool startups in their building so much that they actually formalized this process and invited interesting web startups from all across the world to apply for grant money, this is free money, no investment, and the opportunity to work from Redgate offices and have a free breakfast and lunch every day. And dinner if you hung around in the evenings, which we always did. It's incredible. So by 2009, I found myself surrounded by 15 world-class entrepreneurs and developers. I still don't know what I was doing on the floor. Every single person who worked with me on Reportive, which was my last company, came from this incredible group of entrepreneurs and programmers. Every single person. So was this serendipity or was it hard work? Well, it was through serendipity, 
through a random email that I sent Neil two years prior that I found myself at the start of and then in the middle of Cambridge's best web startup incubator. And it was through hard work that we built Reportive into an organization where it was worth recruiting these people into it. But this isn't the story of Reportive. That story will have to wait for another day. Before I wrap up, though, I want to leave you with one final thought. And this is a quote from the Harvard Business Review. You can read the full article here. Our mind abhors serendipity and instead looks for convenient patterns. You ask somebody, what are the keys to success? And you will get recommendations, paths, approaches, strategies. Then if you ask that same person, how did he or she become successful? It suddenly becomes a story of serendipitous encounters, unexpected changes in plans, and random consequences. It does not make sense to ignore this basic fact about success anymore. Thank you. My name is Seamus. Um, my job is to get millions of women pregnant. Um, it's hard work, um, but someone's got to do it. No, in all, in all seriousness, um, my area of work is human infertility. Um, it's a problem that uh, my parents suffered from and evidently got over. Um, <coughs> It was an awful lot of hard work, they told me, <laughs> in glorious detail when I was about 13. Um, and this is not necessarily what a 13-year-old wants to learn. Um, it, it meant that I was a shy and a tiring type, keeping away from girls until I was uh, well into my late teens. Might have had something to do with those computers as well. Um, what, uh, what I did was um, come to Cambridge, having already started several companies, um, even exited one. Um, before I turned up in Cambridge, having won my scholarship to come over here, I checked out all the societies online because that's the sort of person I am. I'd identified the Entrepreneur Society. I had even emailed to say that I wanted to join and they were like, you're not even at Cambridge. <laughs> it's like, yes, I'm coming. They're like, hold, hold. Um, so I knew that I was interested in business to an extent. Um, but I had an offer to come to Cambridge, um, and uh, you don't turn that down. And in fact, I shut down a couple of businesses um, and pissed, a couple, pissed off a couple of co-founders uh, when I basically got the scholarship offer and went, guys, sorry, I'm off. Um, but that's what you do when you see an opportunity that you just have to grab. And I think there's going to be a huge number of people in this room who are in exactly the same situation as, as I was then. Um, getting your scholarship to Cambridge is um, Definitely, partly serendipity. I mean, how many scholarship applications do they get to the, uh, to the university? Um, moreover, how many of them are from people who are frankly better than any of us that got in, but we just happen to write our application the right way, say the right things. Um, that's actually the difference between two different A-grade people is just what they put down on the paper. That is luck. Being an A-grade person, getting those grades that got you in, everyone here knows that that's hard work, right? It's luck and hard work. So I thought I would uh, give you a bit of a rundown of what I've done in the past and then leave you with some um, home truths about this whole, uh, whole area of entrepreneurship. Um, so who the heck am I? As I say, I did my PhD uh, at the chemistry department. Um, you'll see that my three-year PhD took slightly longer than three years, um, during which time I think I founded three other companies, um, won the university business plan competition three times, um, won the Downing Enterprise competition twice. Actually, one of them was after I technically graduated, but the idea was from beforehand. 
Uh, I also won the Oxford University Business Plan Competition. Um, they were real pissed when they found that out. Um, <laughs> I've um, raised money from um, angels based here in Cambridge uh, three times over on three different companies. Um, I have lost them all their money on one, uh, returned their money with a slight increment on another, and the other one is still going and probably the reason that I'm standing here um, telling you how wonderful this is. Um, that company was Cambridge Temperature Concepts. Um, it was an idea that I had in 2005, uh, whilst avoiding my PhD research in the bottom of a particle accelerator in southern France. Um, I'm an instruments geek. I was building instruments to go on these particle accelerators. Um, and uh, you know, having started the PhD, um, naturally I got thoroughly bored with what I was actually doing and was wanting to do anything else possible. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was looking at was um, the types of sensors and, and systems that we used um, and what else you could use them for. Um, and I realized that uh, some of the systems we were using could be used for, amongst other things, monitoring human physiology. Um, and for some reason, and I have no idea to this day why, um, something happened to click that my parents suffered from infertility. And, one of the things that my mum did was she measured her body temperature you know, at five o'clock every morning and plotted this on a graph and got a wiggly line and this showed that she had ovulated and therefore they had done the right thing at the right time or not. Um, and uh, this was apparently a real pain. Um, she told me about that a lot. Um, <laughs> my father told me about having to sit in an ice-cold bath until certain objects went numb then climbing out of said bath and having to um, do the business with his wife. Now, guys, ice cold bath followed by that. Anyway, um, <laughs> girls, guy out of an ice cold bath doing that? No? Um, to make matters worse, as soon as they'd finished that, that had to be in the morning because my mum had to jump in a car and go down to the doctor's office for an inspection. I kid you not, that's what they went through. Um, that's what people do to have children who have problems of having children. This is in the days before IVF. I'm sure that my parents would have gone for IVF instantly if it was around and presumably if they could afford it. Um, and so I knew a little bit about what they'd been through and so I knew there was a problem to solve here. Um, I came back to Cambridge and um, looked around the university. Um, by that stage I'd won the university business plan competition I think once by that stage already. I was on the committee, I knew lots of people. And I knew that one of the keys is building your team, not just from friends. In fact, if you start a business with friends, I've found, because I've started businesses with friends, you soon stop being friends. Um, then, <laughs> after the business is all over, you then become really good friends because you've been through a lot together. Um, and uh, that can you know, come out positively. But at the time, it's really, really hard. So don't start businesses with friends, um, unless you really are friends forever. Um, so I looked around the university and I wanted to find people who could help me um, to make my idea a reality. Um, and in particular, I needed some biologists um, because uh, I'm a sort of, you know, half physics and chemistry geek. Um, so I met a couple of young ladies doing their PhDs in infertility. Um, in fact, I met them at a bar. I met them at a bar by crashing the college boat club dinner which I highly recommend as a way of meeting co-founders. Um, I met an ex-medical device engineer who was studying at the business school at a drinks reception uh, for some politician who was visiting. Again, highly recommend drinks receptions and ignoring the politician to recruit your team members. Um, met another guy who was a um, trainee uh, medic, uh, went on to become a surgeon. I met him through one of the university sports teams I was on after we'd just beaten Oxford, had a drink or 15, and then uh, out came the idea, and he went, wow, that's cool. Um, again, that's a good way to meet your co-founders. Um, met a, the final guy that we started things off with, who was an ex-paramedic, um, at a party at the house of the guy who was the medical device engineer. Um, so, Go and look around your social circles, but not your immediate social circle. Go and look outside of that. Ask people around you who will help you to turn your idea into reality. And if, if you're not one of those people with an idea, 
And frankly, most of you won't have the idea right now. You'll be trying to find one, and you'll be trying to think up all sorts of crap that you might be able to submit for the business competition. Go find the people with the ideas where you go, wow, that is cool. I want to work with that. Right? Because ideas are very cheap. Good ideas are still very cheap. It's executing the idea that's really, really important. Uh, so I went around, found my co-founders, and off we went. Um, entered business plan competitions. Um, I think we won £20,000 at one point, which paid for our first prototype. Um, didn't tell them that that actually cost us about 150 quid. Um, that proved that the science probably worked. Um, it was clunky, it was awful, it was a shoebox of electronics that was hooked up to a computer. Um, but it um, monitored a woman's physiology through her body temperature uh, thousands of times overnight. Um, and uh, it really worked very, very nicely and it showed that this could work. Um, on the team, as I said, there were these two young ladies doing their PhDs in infertility. Um, and uh, when we demonstrated that the technology could work, in fact, I just wore the thing for the first night that I, I got it working and showed them the data and said, this is cool. Um, and they didn't believe me until I showed what you could do with the data. Um, and uh, they went away and talked to a few of their friends. And women tend to talk to women about this sort of thing far, far more than men do. So that was, that was on like a Friday evening. By the Monday, we had two different couples from around Cambridge calling us to say, we've heard that you've got this prototype thing to help with fertility. Can we have it? Um, we're like, OK. Um, it's, uh, it's this shoebox that you connect to a computer and wire yourself into it. And that means there's an indirect line from the plug to your arm. Um, and we've got no clue whether it works or not. And uh, one of them turned around and said, uh, I'll just send the device, we'll just wheel the computer in from the lounge into the bedroom. Um, and we're like, okay, yeah, we're definitely solving a problem that there's a demand for here. Um, so, yes, it's pure luck that, you know, those people happened to hear about it and tell us about it, but we were absolutely on the way and it could have been any other people that, that went, wow, you know, let, let's go and do this. Um, so, although, in a sense, I agree with uh, Rahul that there is serendipity or luck involved, um, people who put themselves in the position to take advantage of that end up being lucky at some point, right? You will eventually be lucky if you do this sort of thing enough. And then someone will say, that one thing, that was luck. And they won't notice all the millions of other things that you've done that weren't lucky, um, like a couple of my previous enterprises. So, I think it's time for some Bitter truths. If hard work led to success, every woman in Africa would be a millionaire. You guys are not here because you worked hard in school. Rahul is not here because he worked hard making his company and then worked hard selling it. I'm not here because I've worked hard on my dream and my idea in turning it into a company. That is something that we all did. But working hard by itself doesn't get you anywhere. You guys will all know people who worked harder than you in school and got straight Bs. And I bet you, all of you guys feel secretly a little bit guilty that you got to Cambridge and that they didn't. And you sort of hung around in the library reading the computer books that you found mildly interesting rather than doing the homework that was actually assigned. Right? Um, and then when you go and uh, get a company, you work relatively hard, but then you realize that you don't work anywhere near as hard as many other people in the world who are stuck in destitution and poverty. It's not about hard work, or it's not just about hard work. And you have to remember that when you're doing massively long hours, which you will do as you start your company, um, for most of the five years that my company has been running, I have been working six, usually seven days a week, usually 10 to 16 hours a day. That's absolutely normal. Um, my co-founder um, has uh, just gone off and taken her first holiday since we started for two weeks with her boyfriend. That's five years ago we started that company, right? This is hard work, but that's only part of it. If intelligence led to success, academics 
would not have to fight for funding. This room is full of some of the most intelligent people on the planet. That doesn't mean that very many of you at all are going to have successful businesses even if you all start them. Intelligence is not actually that much of an asset in business. Most of business is actually pretty easy. It's a system that's been evolved over thousands of years so that most people can make a living out of it. If you're too smart in business, you end up outthinking the problem and coming up with complex solutions to simple problems that you didn't understand correctly. Business is above all about solving human problems. And intelligence is not necessarily your best guide there. Even if you're selling tech, you're selling tech to humans. There's this phrase that markets don't exist. Consumers don't exist. People exist. If you're going to make a business, you're going to have to sell stuff to people. You don't sell stuff to a marker. And you don't sell stuff to amorphous consumers. You have to know individual people who will part with their money to pay you for whatever it is that you're delivering, and they will do so because you're delivering them enormous value beyond which they value their money. And so they'll exchange the money for whatever you're doing. In my case, I very, very well know that my business is about people, individual people, parting with that money to get a baby. And that money is worth nothing compared to the baby that they go and get. But in a business where you're changing, exchanging derivative contracts in the city of London and making phenomenally more money than I'll ever make, you're convincing other people to put their trust in you and your ability to go and do something. They're buying your ability to do this. They're buying your skill and your knowledge. They are not just putting some cash into a spreadsheet that goes and generates some kind of return. So intelligence, although the intelligence that went into the, into the models that you build might be very high, intelligence is not the only determinant of success in business. In fact, as I suggest, maybe it's a bit of a liability. And if being lucky bought success, then casinos would be out of business. Um, luck is something that definitely has a role in success. Um, Rahul has uh, extolled the virtues of uh, serendipity and being lucky. Um, I would argue that random events are happening all the time. It is not necessarily correct that you have to get lucky every time you see an opportunity and luck is involved. It is necessarily that you have prepared yourself to take advantage of these things as they come along. And that preparation is all about setting yourself up to succeed when the conditions allow it. And finally, if persistence led to success, <laughs> I, I, I apologize to Mitt Romney. Um, <laughs> Persistence is really, really important, right? Um, persistence at the wrong thing, that's bad, right? In business, you have to be able to work out when you should quit being persistent. There, there are so many people who are like, yeah, it's all hard work and persistence, and that's how you get there, and that's <laughs> manifestly not. Um, you have to be able to persist at the right things. And that means you have to be intelligent enough to tell what are the right things. And that means you have to be lucky enough to get in the position where you can take advantage of those right things. Okay? I think you can see where I'm going here. So, what works? Or, I don't know what's going to work for you, but what worked for me? Um, and uh, as you've heard, I've, I've done a few of these things. I've worked with about a half a dozen people in this room in various companies. Um, I've uh, had successes and failures. Um, and in theory, I've, I've got some knowledge to impart. So waiting for it? All of them. Um, and one really important point. Iteration. You're going to get it wrong. 
I absolutely guarantee it, no matter what it is you do in life. You need to then work towards slightly less wrong. And it's how you go about working towards slightly less wrong that is so important. So all of nature is based on random chance and persistent selection. All right? What you need to do is train yourself, put yourself in the position where you can persistently iterate and you can select what's working and what's not and you can make intelligent decisions about where you're going to do that hard work. Right? At each stage, what you're doing will probably have to change. So you should not persist in doing the same thing. But all of those are really key elements in what you're doing. So I think the secret to success is that you make intelligent guesses, guesses involve luck, about what you should work hard on and you should persistently iterate. That's the, that's the closest formula I could come up with when we talked about, you know, what is it, serendipity or hard work? I was like, nah, bullshit, it's none of those. Um, and so, uh, again, apologies to Mitt Romney and friends. Um, success is evolved, not created. So thank you. Um, I look forward to your questions. This is very important. Um, extroverts find networking easy. Um, you aren't necessarily born um, an extrovert, I don't believe. You can turn yourself into it if you see that this is necessary. Um, as I said, I was... Uh, relatively geeky in school, not particularly extroverted. Um, as I went along, I've become much more confident in myself. This is something you can change. Um, when people are uh, introverted and shy, it does hamper their ability to get into large networks. Um, but they always have friends who often know that they are amazing people. So your job as the extrovert is to find the people who know the people who are amazingly good. Um, so one chap who's sitting over there hiding under the desk that I'm not going to ask about this happens to be an amazing programmer and relatively shy. Um, and I heard that this guy was the best programmer in Cambridge. Um, and uh, so I went out of my way to bring him into my social circle and recruited him to my company, um, and uh, he joined one of the whole's companies as well, and we sort of fought over him for a bit. Um, this is what happens with very, very good people. Um, so as an extrovert, you can find these people. You need to know that you are looking for people who aren't at the networking event. Um, the co-founder that uh, is sort of my second in command in our company, she also is uh, quite introverted. Um, she prefers being at scientific conferences than anything to do with networking and fundraising and so on. Um, we work very well together for that reason. Um, she absolutely hates all of these conferences that I go to that are, oh, our business is great, give me money. Um, and uh, she's had to go along to a couple of them and uh, quite happily lets me go off to the you know, five-star hotels funded by, uh, by various corporate investors. This, this is a great way of dividing the work, I think. Um, <clears throat> you need to work with these different personalities in your company. Um, if you are the introvert and you have the amazing idea and you just think that maybe you'd like to run with your business, really go and find yourself an extrovert that doesn't irritate you too much. Um, <laughs> <coughs> that might be hard. <laughs> so I think we need to be very clear why we're doing this networking. You know, every activity we do is for a goal. So let me give you three possible goals. You might be trying to find co-founders. You might be trying to find customers. You might be trying to find investors. Now, once you have a goal, you can build a specific strategy around <coughs> achieving that goal. So in starting Reportive, I needed to find amazing 
co-founders, amazing programmers, amazing entrepreneurs. Through serendipity and hard work, I'd ended up at the start of and in the middle of Cambridge's best web incubator. That was great. For Reportive, we never actually made any revenue. We made 40 cents of revenue by the time we sold. I knew we needed to raise money. And I knew pretty much that we had to be in California in Silicon Valley to raise money. The goal there was to find investors. What do I do? I fly to California and I just start bouncing around all of these meetings, raising capital over a three month period. As for the third goal, well, we never really had any customers. You need to be able to uh, take no many, many times, and you need to be able to listen to it. Uh, the word no by itself is um, not particularly useful because it can mean no, hell no. It can mean uh, no, uh, look, I'm just too busy to think right now. It can mean no, not right now, but maybe later. Um, it can be no, not with you, but with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually one that you really need to watch out for. People don't tend to say it quite like that. Um, if you hear no a lot, you need to understand why you're hearing it. Um, and there's um, a related problem where you hear yes a lot, but you make no traction. Um, because yes can similarly mean yes, go away and stop talking to me. Um, <laughs> It, it can mean, yes, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, and it can mean, yes, actually, you know, give it to me, I've got my checkbook here. Um, and so you have to be able to delve beyond the simple yes, no answer. Um, there's something that um, one of the uh, um, entrepreneurs around Cambridge uh, used to give as an example, uh, what he called ugly baby syndrome, which is always stuck in my mind, given my line of work. Um, being an entrepreneur with an idea is like being a new mum with a baby and a stroller going down the street. Uh, it's very hard for most of your friends and the people that you know and you have social capital with to say, that's a shit idea. <laughs> In the same way, when you see a mum walking down the street with a baby in, it's hideous. You don't say it, right? <laughs> oh, what a lovely baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you need to be a whole lot more nuanced than hearing yes and hearing no. Either of those things was pretty useless, you need to hear more. Uh, so ask open-ended questions. Get used to being uncomfortable with the way that people respond and making other people feel comfortable about making you uncomfortable. If I can sum this up in one phrase, I would advise you to have strong opinions loosely held. That's really what Seamus is getting at here. So when we started our last company, nobody thought it was a good idea. Even Neil, superstar of Cambridge, was like, this is a terrible idea. I don't think it's going to work. My parents thought it was a terrible idea. The, everyone I, was, I thought it was a terrible idea. He, right, everyone was like, this is not going to work. But over the years, I'd got used to initially delib completely deliberately ignore most of what Seamus says, because he it's believes a, it way too thing. much. And then I stop, and I'll think about it an hour later, and I'll usually go, you know what, I don't agree with him, or I don't agree with this investor. And you go on doing what you believe in. You just have to have a rationalization in your mind that you believe that stands up in the face of other people saying no. And sometimes that rationalization won't exist. You'll just be like, well, I believe it because this is my vision. And that's okay too. To, to barrel down a vision is actually one of the main sources of strength for an entrepreneur. I think, frankly, I managed that badly to begin with. Um, there's this um, phrase that people are serial entrepreneurs. Um, I got a reputation uh, during my PhD for being a parallel entrepreneur. Um, I had, I think, four different um, companies or proto companies going at one time. I had received angel funding for one of them, another one I was soliciting funding for, the investors really don't like that um, because they're like, well, they invest in people. 
um, and they invest in teams, and those people can't be half in the idea. Um, so that's something I did really, really badly um, early on in the life of a couple of my companies, including the current company. Um, some of my best investors did not come in in the initial round for my current company. Um, and they didn't do that because they thought that I was scattered, not focusing on one thing directly, um, that I was a personal risk to the viability of the companies I was in. Um, they could well have been right. Um, it took, I think, two more funding rounds for them to see that I was absolutely committed to whatever appeared to be working and that was really going to get traction. My personal reason for picking one or another was always around traction. You can see that you're solving a problem, it's working, customers want it. Um, and business is defined by the ability to make money fundamentally. Now if you don't ever have customers uh, giving you cash, it's a little bit harder to make that call. Um, but once you've got people going, hell yeah, I'm going to give you cash for this, uh, it becomes a little bit easier. Um, there's sort of a proxy for that, which is, I'm going to give you cash to invest in this, and that can make that decision easier as well. Um, but you have to yourself sit back and think, how am I going to make the choice of one thing or another? When am I going to decide this is not leading anywhere? Uh, that's only a decision that you can make, but I would encourage you not to do them quite so parallel as I did. Initially, I suffered from exactly the same problem that Seamus is talking about. I had multiple things going on all the time, and it took me about two years of not making real progress on any of them to realize I was spreading myself way too thin. So then I started focusing. And to, to Shai's point there, no, knowing when to walk away, it, it's a really tough one, actually. It's really hard when your business... You, you kind of have three trajectories for a business. It's obviously failing. It's obviously succeeding. And that covers your bottom 10% and your upper 10%. And in the middle 80%, you don't know whether you're succeeding. You've got some amount of traction, some amount of users, or some amount of customers but you don't know whether you'll ever get to an interesting scale. And that's one of the hardest places to be in. I think people, entrepreneurs, have a natural level of patience for a vision. For some people, it's 10 years. For some people, it's two years. For some people, it's five years. And all of us, no matter how determined we think we are, will eventually lose patience with a vision if it's not achieving the kind of traction that we want. So I think ultimately that's how we make that decision. Uh, one last point, Seamus gave a bit of a, a rule of thumb about people giving you money. That, that's a good reason to keep on going. What do you do when people aren't giving you money? If any of you are thinking about starting web companies or mobile companies or consumer internet companies, how do you know whether you're succeeding? The key, the most important metric is your growth rate. If you can sustain a growth rate of users, and those users are engaged, at anywhere between 2 and 7% per week, and you can do that over a long period of time, like years, you're golden. You're probably on your way to a billion dollar company. If you can't sustain that, you're not. So it's a very simple rule of thumb. Um, so you asked a, a bunch of questions. The, the first was, how do you monetarily survive? I'll, I'll give you a, a, a brief anecdote from my own experience. So the company Mojo that Stu, Seamus, myself, and Sam, who's not here, started, um, was the company that we were able to return our angel investors' capital plus a small increment on. We personally didn't really make all that much money. You know, we were on like 12, 13K a year for about two years. So it's kind of like a PhD stipend, I guess. At the end of that two years, when we finally decided, you know what, this isn't working out, many people would have looked at that situation and said, that was a complete waste of time. 
okay, you, you beat the banks on your angel investor's capital, but great, they could have just put it in the stock market instead. However, at the end of that two years, I was left with two incredible assets. Actually, it's, it's two things that spin off one thing. The one thing was I had gone from not knowing anything about web application development, although I was a reasonably good programmer, to knowing most of what you needed to know, right? So I knew HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, MySQL, the works. That meant I could sell my time at anywhere between 400 and 700 pounds per day. Okay? And I was spending 1,000 pounds a month. Why? Because I was still living the PhD student lifestyle. That meant that if I sold 30 days of my time, I have covered my living expenses for more than a year. As soon as we wound down Mojo, that's exactly what I did. I sold 30 days of my time. Most of it actually to Redgate Software, who had stuff they needed doing, and I was in, literally inside the company, so I just went and pitched them some ideas. And they were like, we'll buy that one. As a consultant. As a consultant. And then I had a year, I had a year to build any company. A year is enough time to explore most ideas. So that was the first thing. I said there was a second thing. The second thing is those skills also gave me the ability to build the first version of Reportive entirely by myself. So for the first six weeks, it was entirely just me. I didn't have to recruit a co-founder. And I've got this belief that actually every company, even if there are multiple co-founders, is essentially started by one person. One person goes, I'm going to invest all of my energy for a few months to go from zero miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. And 100 miles an hour is when you can start to bring other people on board because they perceive a train that is leaving the station. So I hope that answers uh, both of those questions. I think I would uh, give a slightly different answer to, I think, different things that you asked. Um, I would say don't start a company out of your PhD with no money and having to work 19 hours a day and all of that sort of thing. Um, I knew that I had an idea in 2005. We didn't formally incorporate the company until 2006 when we won 20,000 pounds in a competition. Um, we didn't actually kick things off properly until I graduated in the middle of 2007. We didn't raise angel funding until the end of 2007. I knew where I was going with it. Uh, and I took the time during my PhD to set myself up for that. I didn't have a lot of money, but I kept some of my scholarship behind. We had um, won competitions and we got, a, I think, two different government grants that helped pay a little bit. I mean, yeah, you're talking about sub-PhD stipend levels, but I stayed in my same PhD squalid student flat, which was awesome for the parties but less good for working. Um, you can live very, very cheaply because your expectations have been lowered dramatically. Um, any MBA students in the audience? Raise your hand, please. Yep, totally not going to start your own companies. Um, <laughs> you guys, unfortunately, have been out and worked for a lot of money, and someone has told you that you're going to be worth, what's the average MBA starting salary? I think it's 60, something like that. Yeah, hey, come, come work for me, I'll pay you 30. Um, <laughs> not kidding. Um, you guys have an expectation that you're going to have a huge difficulty in adjusting to becoming an entrepreneur and the, the lifestyle that you need to lead for some significant period of time while you kick this off. Um, the professors in the university that you mentioned, they typically aren't running the company when they start it. They typically have an idea and then someone else builds a team. There are systems in place to do exactly this. If you're the person who has an idea, but you're not the person who wants to run the company, you just go and talk to the University Intellectual Property Office and they have a lot of experience in dealing with very bright academics who don't want to own companies. There's even now uh, corporations that are listed on the stock exchange who specialise in taking ideas from academics and starting companies off them. Uh, this is a model that works very well for the academics that want to stay in the university. Um, so that's another way that you can do it, but it's not going to be your company. You're going to end up with a few like single digit percent at the end of that. But it will probably be successful without you 
and you'll be able to say, hey, I invented that. And it depends on what you want out of your life. Um, so for the MBAs out there, um, what you guys probably need to do is um, you've got, what, about six, nine months left around here, right? <laughs> go, and, go and find yourself the people who in about two years will need someone that they can pay the amount you're going to want to be paid. Um, keep in touch with them, watch how that business grows. Uh, go and get your bank job. Earn so much in that year that you can afford to then go and work for them for like 30K. Obviously, you'll be you know, not working for them for nothing. You'll be working for like three times their salary at that point. Um, that approach works very, very well. Um, I have met numerous MBAs um, over the years in the selective theatre who have said, yes, I've got, I've got this idea, I'm going to run with it. Um, I can think of one who actually did it. Um, he went off and became the administrator for the Cambridge Angels, which is the biggest angel investment group here in Cambridge, specifically so that he could meet all the angels, specifically so that he could get his ideas funded. Very directed approach to going and doing it. Um, and he was able to do that because he had banked up such a ludicrously large amount of cash before doing his MBA, which he paid for cash, um, that he could then take that time out and do it. Um, he's the only MBA that I know that's actually in this environment gone off to go and start a company. So yeah, I've, I've witnessed quite a few MBAs in Silicon Valley in California who have managed to make that jump successfully because they want to be a <coughs> co-founder so much it is such a part of what they want to achieve in life that they actually are able to say, you know what, that's okay. I'm, I'm going to go and find a technical co-founder. I'm going to do all the, the really hard, menial work that is involved in starting a business, of which there is tons that they don't want to do. And I'm going to take the, the lifestyle cut in order to make that happen. I've, I've actually seen many people do that. Maybe it's a, that's one of those differences between the environments, but I don't know. I've um, co-founded companies with lots of people, um, and I have employed lots of people. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that the best people that you will have working for you if your company is successful will be people that you hire, not people that you co-found with. Uh, that's simply because you draw on a much bigger talent pool and you have the resources to bring those people in. Um, there's this uh, theory that goes around that you know, you have to be an A team starting off with an idea in order to make a success of it. Um, I think that's absolutely provably bollocks. Um, the, the type of people who start a company are people who aspire to being A people and are willing to work at it. Um, and we're all A people sitting here, right? We're all Cambridge University students. Great, we got A's. Um, depends what you mean an A in. Um, certainly not an A in business in my case. I was a PhD student in chemistry. Um, what you need to look at in co-founders, the people who are going to make a real difference to your business and the state that it is at the moment, um, you need to absolutely be able to trust that you can do that with them. And in some respects, it's like a marriage. I've never been married, but I've heard a lot about this. Um, <laughs> you get married and everyone thinks that this is, this is going to last forever and it'll be great. Um, and therefore, it's impolite to uh, suggest that maybe we should have some documents drawn up about how it won't work. Um, but I really recommend that you draw those documents up. Um, I have had to let co-founders go. Um, I have uh, had to negotiate with people who didn't want to go. Um, this is hard. Um, and you need to make sure that you've had a very adult conversation up front about how that process is going to work. And you do that during the honeymoon period when everyone thinks it's going to be fine. Because otherwise you're not going to have very honest conversations about that when someone feels that you're having this conversation for a good reason. Um, related to that, I would recommend that you do not start companies by splitting equity equally. Um, as Rahul says, a company is often one person and some co-founders. Um, this is frequently not always the case. Um, I have, um, <coughs> if you like, informally consulted to many people who have wanted to start their company and how do you divide the equity. Um, and starting off by saying it's equal is generally a sign that you're avoiding a difficult conversation that everyone knows you need to have. 
Um, so everyone in this room, when someone sits down with you and says, hey, let's just split it equally, red flag instantly, right? You should be debating why that is, because as soon as it's equal, it's really hard to have a conversation about increasing or decreasing someone's shares, right? But even if it's 1% off equal, then you can have that conversation about later, well, we're not exactly equal anyway, and so we've agreed that we're not equal, and some people do put in more than other people do, or turn out to have been more useful, and so maybe we should award that. Um, going equal is uh, a recipe for just putting off difficult conversations. Some people can put off those difficult conversations for years and years and years and years. You know, look at the divorce rate in Victorian times. Um, but, um, <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> uh, I'd actually like to disagree with a large number of those points. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we get along so well. <laughs> um, number one, how do you attract co-founders? So like I've said, start the company yourself. Acquire the skills necessary, if it's building web apps, figure out how to do that. Get a prototype working, get 20 users, whatever it takes. So the people who are probably more skilled than you are at the building of stuff can see what it is you're trying to build and they can perceive that momentum, number one. Number two, I'm a big believer in splitting things equally. Let me explain how this worked for me. For the first six weeks to two, maybe even three months, it was basically just me. Uh, but I knew there were two people I very specifically wanted to bring on board. And when I brought them on board, I said, I trust you guys like you are my own brother. I need to have that trust in order to co-found with somebody. I also want you to care about this company exactly as much as I care. Not 1% less than I care, not 2% less than I care, but exactly as much than I care. And if you're not willing to sign up for that, then piss off, because I don't want you as a co-founder. That's the level of commitment I need from you in this company. And so I didn't see it as unfairly giving away equity. I saw it as, this is a big deal. This means you care as much as I do. Now, in terms of how do you have the difficult arguments, how do you have those difficult conversations, you have to be very clear, very early, who is CEO. In our company, it was very clear, very early, that I was CEO. And if we ever had any difficult decisions, and there were plenty along the way, I ultimately made that final choice. And I would often have to sell that choice, but that's a good process to go through because you end up having to defend your decisions. Well, one place where I will agree with Seamus is have those documents ready. It sounds like a complicated, scary thing, but the internet is full of advice on how to structure founding agreements so that if one person leaves, then their equity does not become dead weight. It gets put back into the company so you can redistribute it to the people who continue to work with you. And that's probably as succinct as I can be. <laughs> <laughs>